changes in temperature. Now, in plants, glyceolins are known to have antifungal, antibacterial, anti-nematode activity. But in mammalian systems, um, in us and animals in general, um, glyceolins exhibit anti-tumor activity, antioxidant activity, insulinotropic activity, um, and nutrient metabolism activity. So there were many known mechanisms of glyceolin action before I started my dissertation work. And the initial work in mammalian systems focused on the ER mediated, which is estrogen receptor mediated effects of glyceolins. What this means is the compound can interact with estrogen receptors and produce an effect. And predominantly these effects were anti-estrogenic, which means it binds to estrogen receptors, but it does the opposite of what estrogen would do when estrogen binds to its own receptors, right? So some of these effects were um, in vitro in tumor cells, um, glyceolin treatment suppressed estrogen-stimulated proliferation of breast cancer cells, okay? It also suppressed breast and ovarian tumor growth um, in vivo, in an animal model, uh, animal tumor <laughs> model, and it suppressed estrogen-stimulated uterine growth. And all of this was through activity at estrogen receptor alpha, or what, as you'll see later in the talk, ESR1, which is exactly the same receptor, but two different ways of saying it. One study also found that it could also increase the proliferation of breast tumor cells if it acts through another receptor, estrogen receptor, which is estrogen receptor beta. Later on, um, people found uh, non-estrogen receptor mediated effects of glyceolins as well. So this was not just only estrogen receptor mediated. It also suppressed lipid peroxidation, increased insulin stimulated glucose uptake in adipocytes, increased insulin sensitivity. So this is all diabetes related work, right? And this was first found in vitro that hmm, it's doing all these things without interacting at estrogen receptors. And in vivo, in mouse models, it suppressed triple negative breast cancers as well, which do not contain estrogen receptors, so non-ER mediated. And it suppressed blood glucose levels in male rats and mice and increased lipid metabolism gene expression. And some of these effects are kind of both. So it is an effect on estrogen receptor alpha, but an indirect effect with glyceolin acting on or regulating the phosphorylation of these estrogen receptors. What was missing and what I worked on was, no one had looked at what glyceolin is doing in the brain. How does it regulate gene expression in the brain? Now estrogens, obviously, act at estrogen receptors in the brain, and they perform many, many different functions, okay? There are functions related to reproduction, cognition, neuroprotection, food intake, mood regulation, thermoregulation. All of this is carried out by estrogen in the brain. Now, given what we knew about the literature and how glyceolins can act at estrogen receptors and act uh, both in vitro and in vivo on tumor cells, as well as in uh, terms of uterine growth in vivo, we figured maybe it's doing something in the brain. Is it estrogen receptor mediated? Is it not? And the most important part was we know what it does in tumor cells. We know what it does in the periphery, which is the rest of the body. But these effects can be very different in the periphery as compared to the brain. Okay? So it might, might be acting anti-estrogenically all over the body, but in the brain, it might be acting estrogenically. It might not be acting at estrogen receptors at all. We just didn't know. So that is why we wanted to investigate the mechanisms by which glyceolins act in the brain. Now, if you want money from NIH, you have to have biomedical significance. What is the importance of this work? You all have probably heard of estrogen replacement therapy and it is basically to alleviate um, menopausal symptoms in uh, postmenopausal women and also to alleviate uh, symptoms of cognitive decline which are also associated with low levels of estrogen in these postmenopausal women. 
But if you give these women estrogen, you're increases their, increasing their chances of estrogen responsive tumors, right? Like breast and ovarian and uterine cancers. Now, before glyceolins were discovered, there were two compounds, um, daidzine and genistine, also soy plant compounds, and they were found to exhibit neuroprotective effects at lower concentrations, but you blast the person with these chemicals and it can have neurotoxic effects. Also, both of these compounds had massive anti-tumor effects, suppressing breast and ovarian tumors, but they acted estrogenically in the uterus. So they suppress breast and ovarian tumors, but increase your chances of getting uterine tumors. So not great, right? Glyceolin, on the other hand, was different because it acted anti-estrogenically in the uterus. So it can help suppress breast and ovarian tumors without increasing the chance of uterine cancer. And because we knew of its effects on glucose and lipid metabolism that were not um, estrogen receptor mediated, we decided that A, we need to test what it does in the brain, and the knowledge of what it does in the brain is important in order to develop this compound as a therapeutic agent or a dietary supplement. So these were the three different experiments um, that I performed, uh, the three major experiments that I performed. I performed a lot more than this one, <laughs> during my dissertation. And I will go over each of these in detail as I go on. So the big picture of my entire project was we wanted to evaluate what was the effect of glyceolin by itself or in combination with estrogen on gene expression in the female mouse brain. Now, why did we pick the female mouse brain? Yeah, because we're looking at estrogen receptor mediated effects. We're looking at all these effects of estrogen. So we looked at female mice. Does that mean that men don't have estrogen? Not really. Um, also, um, testosterone gets converted to estrogen in the brain, and, and that's what's acting in the male brain, too. So, you know. But we use female mice predominantly, and you'll see this um, when I talk, is because we did all of our injections intraperitoneally, and so we were looking at uh, the effects of, you know, this compound and estrogen, like crossing the blood brain barrier and doing things in the brain. Um, our hypothesis was that given all of these anti-estrogenic effects of glyceolin in the periphery um, that we know of, or in the rest of the body that we know of, we hypothesized glyceolin probably opposes the effect of estrogen on gene expression in the female mouse brain. That is, we hypothesized that it acts anti-estrogenically. And this was our setup. We purchased ovaryectomized, so these female mice did not have any ovaries, okay? We did not want to, when you're working with estrogen, you don't want to deal with cycling animals, okay? It is, it is great if, if, if you do, because it gives you a better idea of a normal working system, but we're also giving these females estrogen, right? So we want those levels to be stable, more or less, you know, across our treatment group. So these are ovaryectomized, and these were implanted with either placebo pellets, so nothing, or 17-beta estradiol, which is the most active form of E2, or estrogen. And after one week of um, rest for the mice, we had 11 consecutive days of intraperitoneal glyceolin or vehicle injections. So placebo um, pl uh, pellets with vehicle injections were our control group. Placebo pellets with glyceolin injections were our gly only. Estradiol pellets with vehicle injections were our estrogen only group. And estradiol pellets with glyceolin injections are estrogen plus glyceolin. Now I need you to understand the setup of this experiment, okay? We wanted to see what glyceolin is doing and how it's regulating gene expression in the brain by itself compared it to what estrogen is doing by itself. And if it has anti-estrogenic effects, we figured it would show up here, right? So if estrogen only was upregulating a whole suite of genes, for example, right? 
we expected that glyceolin would not be by itself regulating anything compared to control, but in combination with estrogen, it would suppress the estrogen upregulation of these genes or oppose the effect of estrogen on gene expression. After these 11 consecutive days of injections, which is considered a chronic dose because we're injecting them every day for 11 days, we harvested tissues on day 12 and we extracted RNA from the whole brain. So these were the results. Now stick with me here, okay? You'll see these types of graphs throughout my talk and uh, you need to understand how it's set up. So a lot of these analyses are done uh, using two-way ANOVA, okay? Um, analysis of variants with estrogen and glyceolin as factors. So we're looking for main effects of estrogen on gene expression, main effects of glyceolin on gene expression, and an interaction effect between those two factors, right? So here you have control in green, estrogen in blue, glyceolin only in yellow, and estrogen plus glyceolin in red. And you'll see these colors throughout the top. Here on the x-axis, you have glyceolin, no, which means both of these uh, groups do not have glyceolin, control and estrogen only. Both of these group, groups have glyceolin, glyceolin only and estrogen plus glyceolin, right? The horizontal lines, the, uh, the, the solid line connects the two estrogen groups, and the dotted line uh, connects the two non-estrogen groups. So here's what you'll see. If there is an estrogen main effect, no interaction, you will see these two lines parallel to each other, okay, without any interaction effect. If there is a main effect on, of glyceolin, no interaction effect, these lines will still be parallel, but they will <laughs> slope this way or that way, depending on whether glyceolin is up or down regulating these genes. Okay? And if there is an interaction effect, the two lines would cross each other. So here, you can see these crazy error bars. We're looking at body mass in grams, and body mass of this, these mice did not differ between treatment groups. In B, we're looking at the natural log transformed plasma estrogen concentration of um, these animals, okay? You're, we're delivering estrogen. We want to make sure that estrogen animals have estrogen and the non-estrogen animals don't which is why we have an estrogen main effect as expected. Both the non-estrogen groups have much less or significantly less estrogen than the estrogen groups. Great. We also saw a glyceolin main effect, which was surprising to us, and it was driven by this reduction of uh, plasma E2 in the estrogen plus glyceolin group compared to estrogen alone. Okay? And this told us Maybe glyceolin opposes the effect of estrogen by clearing out some of the estrogen from the plasma itself. But at this early stage, we couldn't tell that for sure. Now, before I go into my microarray results, I just thought I'll give you an overview of how a microarray analysis works. Okay? You have RNA that you extract from your tissue, so I extracted RNA from the whole brain. You convert it to cDNA through reverse transcription, okay? So cDNA is DNA without introns, okay? It is just your gene coding regions of uh, the DNA. And we, of course, I had control and three experimental groups, so imagine two other bubbles here, okay? And all of the cDNA from all of these treatment groups are um, attached to these fluorescent dyes. And samples from each of these treatments is added into each one of these wells on this microarray chip. Now the mouse genome has 23 to 25,000 known genes and we're just looking at a subset that are present on this chip. Okay? And because the different treatment groups have differently labeled fluorescent dyes, you use different dye-specific frequencies and laser emission to get these images per treatment group. And then the computer calculates the ratio of the intensity. You get to know about gene expression in each of these groups, and then you compare it to look for differential expression of genes between these treatments. Does that make sense? Okay. So this, 
was a pretty heat map from our microarray results. So we identified a total of 279 differentially expressed genes that were identified, and the, that means these were differentially expressed in one or more treatment comparisons, right? And the main takeaway message here is, if you look at this, we did a hierarchical cluster analysis here, and um, let me explain this heat map. The rows on this heat map, each row is one of the 279 differentially expressed genes. Going from green to red on this scale is low expression to high gene expression, with black being intermediate between the two. Okay. And each column is a different biological replicate within a treatment group. So these three animals were our glyceolin only animals, these three were our control animals, these two were estrogen only, and last two were estrogen plus glyceolin. And what you can see here is that compared to all of these three groups, glyceolin showed a gene expression profile that was distinct and clustered completely separately from the remaining three groups. And what we saw was that the two estrogen groups were most similar to each other in terms of gene expression, and glyceolin overall showed an opposite pattern of expression compared to the two estrogen groups. Okay, so that was cool. Now here on this um, uh, slide, I'm going to show you some graphs that are just arbitrary units. So these are not actual data points. This is just to give you a feel for what different expression patterns we saw with these genes. So here, um, we out of the 279 differentially expressed genes, 33 of them had only an estrogen main effect, no interaction effect, right? So you see this here, lines are parallel, okay? And either uh, gene expression was upregulated in the two estrogen groups compared to the non-estrogen groups, or vice versa, where they were downregulated in the estrogen groups. So estrogen main effect. Five of these genes had a glyceolin main effect. So again, lines are parallel, but they're slopey now because of the glyceolin main effect. So here, either the gene expression was upregulated in the two glyceolin groups compared to the non-glyceolin groups, or vice versa. There were 74 genes that had both an estrogen and glyceolin main effect no interaction effect, which followed these basic four patterns, right? So these are separated horizontally as well as slopey, both estrogen and glyceolin main effects. So these were either upregulated in both glyceolin groups compared to non-glyceolin groups and downregulated in estrogen groups compared to non-estrogen groups or vice versa. And here, upregulated in estrogen groups compared to non-estrogen groups and upregulated in glyceolin groups compared to non-glyceolin groups or vice versa. Okay. One of um, the graphs that I'll show you now, we had 167 genes that had this interaction effect, so the lines cross, right? I'm not going to show you the 20 different patterns that we saw within these 167 genes because it's crazy, right? But this was of interest to us. So remember I said we expected predominantly glyceolin to oppose the effect of estrogen on gene expression in the brain. But for 59 genes, we observed this pattern that was interesting. Compared to control, glyceolin upregulated gene expression. Estrogen was not significantly different from control, but when estrogen is added to glyceolin, it suppresses this glyceolin upregulation of the gene, okay? So that meant that estrogen was opposing the effect of glyceolin on the expression of these genes, which was exactly the opposite of what we had expected. So we thought it was cool. On this um, slide, I'm going to show you data that is microarray data and quantitative real-time PCR data. Now, both of these are different types of experiments, but whenever you do uh, a whole, uh, like a 
large genomic assay like a microarray or RNA sequencing, you have to validate your data with quantitative real-time PCR. And we validated our microarray results with eight genes. I'm not going to show you the eight genes, only three that you will see later in the talk as well. So on the y-axis, we have centered and scaled log two expression values. So we can put both the microarray and PCR data on one graph. The colors are the same as before. Solid graphs are the microarray data. The checkered uh, graphs um, or bars are the PCR data. So as you can see, we could validate our um, trends pretty well with quantitative PCR. This gene is interesting because it was one of the 59 genes that I just talked about with a significant interaction effect that showed an opposite pattern of what we expected. So it was the most highly upregulated gene by glyceolin in the whole brain compared to control. Estrogen was very similar to control, but estrogen added to glyceolin suppresses this glyceolin upregulation of this gene. Now, growth hormone and prolactin, I'm showing you these because these will come up uh, in the talk later. I, we use these for validation of our PCR data, but look at these crazy error bars. <laughs> these were not significantly differentially expressed, okay? But I just wanted to show you this pattern. Estrogen upregulates the expression of both of these genes compared to control. Glyceolin by itself is not different from control, but when glyceolin is added to estrogen here, it suppresses this estrogen upregulation. Now this was the pattern that we actually expected, an anti-estrogenic pattern. Um, so to summarize uh, the results for the first experiment, we expected that GLI would predominantly oppose the effects of estrogen on gene expression in the brain. We did see a lot of that, but we also uh, saw results that didn't seem to be estrogen receptor mediated. In terms of brain function, now we're looking at all of these genes, but what does it mean in terms of brain function, right? So the genes that had a GLI main effect were involved in neurogenesis, tissue development, and immune responses, and these were upregulated by glyceolin. So glyceolin is promoting neurogenesis. It downregulated one gene that, was, that is involved in apoptosis and neurodegeneration in the brain. Okay. Genes with an estrogen main effect are involved in all kinds of things. This is just a short list. Neurogenesis, general neural maintenance, etc. Genes that had both an estrogen and glyceolin main effect, no interaction, again, were involved in neurogenesis, maintenance, neurotransmitter release in the brain. And lastly, the genes that had an interaction effect, slightly different functions involved in development, migration, immune responses, and so on. So in conclusion, we found that GLI upregulated genes that were involved in neurogenesis it downregulated a gene involved in apoptosis and neurodegeneration. So maybe it has a potential neuroprotective role in the brain. And just based on patterns of gene expression compared to estrogen only and in combination with estrogen, glyceolin seemed to act through both estrogen receptor mediated and non estrogen receptor mediated uh, mechanisms in the brain. Now we move on to experiment two, which is again a whole brain gene expression experiment. Purpose was exactly the same, to evaluate the effects of glyceolin alone and in combination with estrogen on gene expression in the female mouse brain. And we hypothesized the exact same thing. Glyceolin opposes the estrogen effect on gene expression and <coughs> predominantly acts anti-estrogenically in the brain. So you might think you already did, or I already did, a whole brain microarray experiment. We looked at global gene expression. Why perform an RNA sequencing experiment again? Well, because someone offered to pay for it. <coughs> but, but also for these reasons. So RNA sequencing has a much higher sensitivity and specificity in terms of detecting genes and transcripts 
and in identifying differential expression between treatment groups. So that is one advantage. Two, microarray can sometimes miss out on genes that are very high expression genes or very low expression genes because in microarray you're dependent on hybridization of cDNA to these probes that are on a chip. Whereas in RNA sequencing, you are looking at whole genome expression. And this will get clearer <coughs> the, on the slide after this. So our experimental setup was exactly the same, in fact, as the microarray experiment. In fact, the samples, the RNA samples were exactly the same, but one caveat, okay? We had two to three animals per treatment group in the microarray experiment. We had to pull the RNA from all of these animals within each treatment group. And essentially, we had one sample per treatment group for the RNA sequencing experiment. So this is how RNA sequencing works. And it's different from microarray in that here's your RNA that you extract from the tissue. You again reverse transcribe it, get to cDNA. You fragment the cDNA from all your experimental groups. These are then selected for size, and this is called Illumina paired end sequencing. So each of these little tiny pieces of cDNA, they're sequenced, only their ends are sequenced. Okay? And then this goes through data analysis. So you put in these raw reads of these cDNA with these paired ends. It goes through quality check and pre-processing. Now we already know, and we've known the mouse genome, and we even know the human genome. Right? You know this, right? <laughs> so we map using a, an already known mouse genome database. You align the cDNA reads <coughs> with the mouse genome. And then the computer does some counting. So how many transcripts are present for each of these uh, different genes um, in each of the treatment groups? And then, obviously, you do differential analysis to get to differential gene expression and biological interpretation of this, which, by the way, is much harder than it looks here. Um, here are our results from the RNA sequencing. So now we're looking at another heat map, different from the one that we saw for the microarray. Here, we identified a total of 58,059 differentially expressed not genes, so ignore the G up there, differentially expressed transcripts. Okay. Now transcripts are different from genes, how? In that gene in itself can be spliced in many, many different ways to get different transcripts for the same gene. Okay. So like I said, the whole mouse genome has about 23 to 25,000 genes, so there's no way we identify. Need to unlock the phone first. Bixby. Um, so there's no way we found 58,000 genes. These are transcripts, okay? And because we have an N of 1 per treatment group, remember, uh, there's no p-values to rely on. So we used a ridiculous full change cutoff to determine differential expression of these transcripts between treatments. So we did eight different treatment comparisons. We compared each treatment to every other treatment. And we used a full change cutoff of greater than or equal to four, which means in any two treat in comparing any two treatments, we said this particular gene should be four times higher in expression than this other group for it to be differentially expressed. So here again, these rows are the 58,059 transcripts. Columns are the different treatment groups, control, glyceolin, estrogen, and estrogen plus glyceolin. And what was similar to the microarray experiment is that if you look at this, of course, the color scheme is a little bit different. So going from black more towards orange, yellow, and white is low to high expression. So all the red here is low expression, black is very low expression. Orange is kind of intermediate, going towards yellow is higher gene expression. So both the estrogen groups were the most similar to each other again in terms of gene expression, just like what we saw in the microarray. But what we didn't see in the microarray that we could see now that we had a bigger data set looking at uh, large groups of genes was that glyceolin 
was also similar to estrogen only in many cases here, which, were, which we didn't see in the microarray experiment. Also, growth hormone and prolactin, which were not significantly differentially expressed in the microarray experiment, we did see differential expression in estrogen only versus control. Now you look at these values and you're like, oh my God, seven million times higher in E2 compared to control? That's nuts, okay? The reason why you see these values is because there's, the gene expression is so low, it's like 0 .0000000 something micromolar. So even if you have a full change of value of one in estrogen, <coughs> it's going to look like a million fold upregulation compared to baseline because the baseline itself is that low, right? So for both growth hormone and prolactin, estrogen upregulated expression compared to control. Glyciolin, on the other hand, by itself, didn't really regulate these genes at all. But when you add glyciolin to estrogen, it suppresses the estrogen-only upregulation of both growth hormone and prolactin, right? And this is basically what these points are saying. Um, so we found that glyciolin exhibits this classic anti-estrogenic <coughs> effect on the expression of growth hormone and prolactin. So in summary, what we didn't see in the microarray was that GLY, similar to E2, regulates genes that are involved in hormone signaling, cytoskeletal modeling, some immune responses, and nerve impulses. Like the microarray, it downregulated some pro-apoptotic genes indicating a potential neuroprotective role in the brain. There was no effect of estrogen or glyciolin on the expression of estrogen receptors. Now, I didn't talk about this at all, so what am I talking about here? Estrogen usually down-regulates the expression of its own receptor, kind of like a negative feedback loop. So we were kind of surprised that we didn't see anything going on with estrogen on expression of ERs, but we did not see anything. Glyciolin exhibited a classic anti-estrogenic effect, and what I, mean, what I mean by classic is classically anti-estrogenic because glyciolin was considered classically anti-estrogenic uh, <coughs> for the longest time. So in conclusion, glyciolin sometimes acts similarly to E2, sometimes it <coughs> opposes the E2 effect on gene expression in the brain, so maybe it acts as a selective estrogen receptor modulator, which means maybe it acts at different estrogen receptors and does different things, sometimes acting similar to estrogen, sometimes opposing its effect. And there were a whole suite of genes that were regulated by uh, glyciolin independent of any estrogen or estrogen receptor mediated action. So that was cool too. So what was next after all of the whole brain stuff? Now, if you guys know anything about the brain, it's complicated, right, in a nutshell. But there are many, many different brain regions. Even within these brain regions, the brain can be very heterogeneous, especially in terms of gene expression. So firstly, what we thought of is, okay, we only looked at this one time point of glyciolin exposure. It was a chronic dose, 11 consecutive days of glyciolin injection, right? So does glyciolin have any acute effects on gene expression? What if we just inject glyciolin once, and what happens to gene expression in that case? Does glyciolin have any brain region specific effects? So instead of looking at gene expression globally across the brain, where you can kind of probably see a wash of effects on gene expression, right? Because a gene may be very, very high in one region and very low in the other. You're averaging across the brain. You're seeing some kind of medium effect, right? So we said maybe we should look at different brain regions. Now, which brain regions did we focus on? We focused on cortex. Okay. This is also a really huge region to look at by itself but it's responsible in processing of chemosensory stimuli, all of your higher order uh, cognitive processes. We looked at the hippocampus over here. Hippocampus is involved in learning, memory, and cognition again. Very important brain region. 
and the hypothalamus, which pretty much does everything. It stimulates um, hormones from the pituitary gland, so it's involved in hormone signaling. These are the functions are, you know, uh, reproduction, stress, food intake, <coughs> mood regulation, thermal regulation. All of this happens in the hypothalamus. So we were looking at those three brain regions. And instead of looking at global gene expression in these three brain regions, we focused on four genes of interest. One was estrogen receptor 1, or ER alpha, like you saw before. Glyciolins have a really high affinity for estrogen receptor 1 as compared to estrogen receptor 2. These are usually down-regulated by estrogen in the brain, and this is involved in reproduction, cognition, stress, all types of other activities or functions. NR4A1 was the gene that I showed you earlier, most highly upregulated gene by glyciolin in the microarray experiment. And it's interesting because it is usually downregulated by estrogen in the hypothalamus and cortex. So we were like, hmm, downregulated by estrogen, this is known. We saw upregulation with glyciolin. What's going on? And it's an immediate early response gene, which means it is upregulated very rapidly in the brain in response to a stimulus. And it is known to be involved in stress, food intake, some memory, etc. Growth hormone is generally upregulated by estrogen. You may know it as the pituitary hormone, growth hormone, which it is, but it is also produced locally in the brain in the hippocampus, so it was interesting to us and it is involved in food intake and appetite in the hypothalamus and memory formation, mood and cognition in the hippocampus. Prolactin is also generally upregulated by estrogen and is involved in neurogenesis, maternal behavior, food intake and stress. So these are our genes of interest. Now here it gets a little complicated. <laughs> we looked at the purpose of experiment three here was to look at the effects of acute versus chronic glyciolin exposure on the mRNA expression of four specific genes in three specific brain regions. So, you know, easy peasy, we're looking at um, four different treatments, three brain regions, and four different genes, and four time points of exposure. So, it was, you know. Um, we hypothesized several different things, right? We hypothesized first that glyciolin treatment would oppose the estrogen down regulation of ESR1 in all three brain regions in both types of doses. With the effect, sorry, with the effect being more prominent in the hypothalamus because ESR1 expression is very high in the hypothalamus compared to the other two brain regions. We hypothesized that glyciolin would oppose the estrogen upregulation of growth hormone and prolactin, like we saw in the RNA sequencing data, in all brain regions uh, tested. And we thought we would probably see this in the chronic dose and not um, acutely. We hypothesized that glyciolin would upregulate the expression of NR4A1, like we saw with the microarray data with estrogen opposing the NR4A1 upregulation. And we thought that because NR4A1 is an immediate early response gene, that we may see these effects sooner in the acute doses. And lastly, because the hypothalamus has very high levels of estrogen receptor 1, and glyciolin produces most of its anti-estrogenic effects through that receptor that most of the estrogen receptor mediated anti-estrogenic effects would be pronounced, more pronounced in the hypothalamus. We were wrong about everything, I'm just joking. Um, so our experimental setup was, uh, this time we purchased the female mice, we overreactimized them um, ourselves in the lab, and we planted them with celastic capsules, either placebo or 17 beta estradiol, just like before. Now here, I need you to pay a little bit of attention. We had our four treatment groups just like before, but we have four time points of glyciolin exposure, okay? So for two hours, 24 hours, and 48 hours, we had our animals for all four treatments, 
right? And the brain was dissected two hours after a single acute dose of glyceolin. Same with 24 and 48. So these are our acute doses. One single dose of glyceolin, we're looking at gene expression two hours later, 24 hours later, and 48 hours later, okay? And the chronic dose, which is seven day, is seven <coughs> consecutive days of glyceolin injection, and the brain was harvested on day eight, okay? And like I said, we looked at three different brain regions, and we did quantitative real-time PCR to look at gene expression of our four targets. So, on this graph, we're looking at the effects of brain region and timing. There's so much on this graph that my head spins just talking about it. So, but try to not get overwhelmed by this. So you see, uh, this is ESR1 expression across all four treatments on these four graphs. On the y-axis, you have mean log 10 initial target concentration in micromolar. Now you might ask me, why are these negative values? Is this down regulation? Is this negative gene expression? No, neither, okay? The reason why they're negative is because the non-log10 transformed values, the true values of these genes in micromolar are so tiny that putting them on a graph just looks like there is absolutely nothing going on. It looks like one solid line because um, very small micromolar differences in genes produce very different effects. So this is why we represent it this way, so you can actually see something, okay? On the y axis, sorry, on the x axis, you have two hour, 24 hour, 48 hours. So remember, this is gene expression <coughs> after one glyceolin dose, two hour, 24 hour, 48 hour later. This cannot be directly compared to these because this is seven consecutive days of glyceolin injection. So remember that too. Here, there's nothing much going on on these graphs. You're like, well, there's quite a bit going on, but not really, because what we're really interested in seeing is differences between treatment groups with the different brain regions, which we don't see. But what we do see was something expected is that the hypothalamic concentration of ESR1 was higher so green is hypothalamus, sorry. Uh, the orange is hippocampus and the purple is cortex. So the hypothalamic levels of ESR1 are higher as compared to the other two brain regions. But this is irrespective of treatment, so it's not fun for us. And R4A1, same thing. We see some cool stuff happening, especially here at seven days, there's this upregulation of NR4A1 in the cortex compared to hypothalamus and hippocampus. But again, this is an effect that we're seeing in all treatment groups. So it's not what is glyceolin doing compared to estrogen. It's not answering any of that. And what I want to point out here is with growth hormone and prolactin, look at the levels here, how low they are. Minus 13 to minus 16 as compared to ESR1 and NR41. So irrespective of brain region, Growth hormone and prolactin are very, very low expression genes compared to NR4A1 and ESR1. Now we'll look at results. Um, you'll see similar graphs that you saw before with a, a two-way ANOVA type of graphs. And we're looking at each brain region separately. So what was going on in the hypothalamus, the brain region involved in reproduction, cognition, stress, mood regulation, and so on? We found a trend towards significance, so not really significant. Main estrogen effect on ESR1 expression at two hours. So two hours after a glyceolin injection, as both estrogen groups down-regulated ESR1 compared to the non-estrogen groups. There was also a significant glyceolin main effect, right? So they're not crossing, so no interaction <coughs> effect here. Both glyceolin groups upregulate the expression of growth hormone and prolactin compared to the non-glyceolin groups at two hours. And there was a glyceolin main effect on prolactin after 24 hours after a single injection with, again, glyceolin groups upregulating expression compared to non-glyceolin groups. What's going on in the hippocampus, the region associated with learning, memory, and cognition? We saw a kind of 
significant, but not really. Marginally significant glyciolin main effect after 24 hours on expression of ESR1 with glyciolin down groups down regulating expression compared to non glyciolin groups. And a significant glyciolin main effect on growth hormone expression at two hours. What was going on in the cortex? We saw a significant glyciolin main effect on growth hormone and prolactin expression after two hours after the glyciolin injection. And a marginally significant, again, but not really, effect of estrogen. So you see both estrogen groups upregulating prolactin compared to non estrogen groups at 24 hours. And you can see that this estrogen main effect is driven by the high prolactin in the estrogen plus glyciolin group. So in summary, we had glyciolin main effects at two hours for growth hormone expression in all three brain regions tested. We had significant glyciolin main effects on prolactin expression at two hours and 24 hours in the hypothalamus and at two hours in the cortex, but not in the hippocampus. And we had a somewhat significant, but not really, trend towards significance um, for E2 downregulation of ESR1 in the hypothalamus and glyciolin downregulation of estrogen receptor 1 in the hippocampus. What we did not see was no effect of estrogen or glyciolin on expression of estrogen receptors. So just like our whole brain experiments, we didn't see um, effects on estrogen receptors even in the three brain regions. We didn't see any effect of the different treatments on NR4A1 expression. And we did not see any effects at the chronic exposure time, which was kind of weird because we, we saw quite a bit going on in the whole brain with the 11 consecutive days of you know, treatment. So this was surprising, but we didn't see anything. And like I told you before, growth hormone and prolactin are involved in many different processes, right? Cognition, food intake, appetite, stress. So maybe glyciolin, through its effects on growth hormone and prolactin, especially in acute doses, may regulate processes involved um, in food intake, stress, and cognition in the female mouse brain. Our overall summary was Gly sometimes acts similarly to E2, sometimes opposes its effect, maybe acts as a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It exhibits potentially estrogen receptor um, independent effects, which means not associated with estrogen effects on gene expression. It upregulated genes involved in neurogenesis, downregulated some pro apoptotic genes involved in neurodegeneration indicating a potential neuroprotective role in the brain. And lastly, through its effects on growth hormone and prolactin, it may regulate processes involved in food intake, stress, and cognition in the three brain regions tested. So what I'm not working on, and what is going on in my PhD mentor's lab, is now looking at protein expression. So all of this was messenger RNA expression looking at estrogen receptor knockout models. So knock out these estrogen receptors and see how it affects the expression of these genes with the treatment to parse out mechanisms of action. Direct versus indirect effects, right? All of our injections were done intraperitoneally, assuming that glyciolin is passing the blood, crossing the blood-brain barrier and having effects on the brain. But is this a direct effect or is this an effect in the periphery that is indirectly affecting gene expression in the brain. To get to that, we would need to use neuronal cell models, treat these cells directly with glyciolin or estrogen, and see if these are direct effects. And behavioral effects, this is the most important, right? <coughs> to develop some, a compound as a dietary supplement, you need to know, is it making me crazy if I take this over time? Like, it doesn't have any um, cognitive um, decline implications. What is it doing in the brain? So we already knew all of these effects, anti-tumor, nutrient metabolism, antimicrobial, oxidant, anti-inflammatory effects. And my dissertation for the first time showed that we might also have, or glyciolins may also exhibit some potential central nervous system effects. And with that, I'll thank my PhD mentor, Dr. Corbett, 
Um, everyone in our lab, my committee members really helped me make my work better. All my, all the professors who helped with uh, stats, collaborators, and my funding sources. And with that, um, I will take any questions. You guys understood everything. It's as clear as mud, right? <laughs> well, I, I had a general question. Why, why, is it known why this, these soy beans have these kinds of chemicals? What is it about soy, soy beans or soy plants? Actually, it's not just um, soy. It's um, uh, these compounds are like just <clears throat> in the plant itself. It's just general plant defense compounds. So like how they combat against uh, diseases. And so the these compounds are produced by these plants not when we eat them, but um, when they're stressed. And so these are defending the plant from like herbivory or uh, bacterial or fungal infections. And since like the early 80s. Um, these compounds are being detected. They're like, hmm, they're plant defense compounds. And suddenly they're like, oh, let's put them on tumor cells. And oh my God, suppression. And so from the 80s, they're just looking at these plant compounds, which is like the major, um, I don't know if you guys know about this, like Ayurveda industry in India. It's like these, these compounds that are just like um, isolated from plants. <coughs> and effects are tested on tumor cells and for diabetes and things like that. And they then develop these products, but glyceolins have been are being studied since the late, actually, in terms of plant work, early mid 1990, and mammalian system work started in 2000, and it still hasn't reached clinical trials that I know of. So it's going to be a while. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.